When I was starting to make YouTube videos seven years ago, video encoding was kinda ignored. No creator really knew what he was doing and just used built-in presets from his video editor. Nowadays it seems like every second person is a content creator, but still there is no proper guide on how you should encode videos for online platforms or for your own VOD site. This is a very advanced topic, so I decided to split this into several parts, and in each part you will get a lot of knowledge. I also divided each part into segments, so you can easily learn something, refresh your knowledge, or check if you don't believe in some old myths. Let's start. Video Codex. There are a tons of them. Between centuries we had rapid fast development of hardware. We quickly got from VHS to CD and then DVD. From small CRT TVs to widescreen flat displays. We wanted to have cinema quality movies in our homes, and the companies tried their best to do it, but they weren't cooperating. We got DivX, which was supported in some devices. We got Real Video, which was supported in some devices. Yeah, you got an idea. Nothing universal. There was a huge need of some standard that will be accepted by everyone and could start high definition revolution. That's how H.264 AVC was born. It was made by MPEG, which is an alliance between a lot of big corporations that allowed to use their patents to build one good unified technology. But these are still corporations, greedy corporations. H.264 has a fee. It's very minimal, included in price of hardware, and basically nobody thinks about it nowadays, but corporate greed exists, and Google wasn't happy that they need to pay someone else to have their streaming service, YouTube, running. That's why Google got onto technologies, a company that was making their own video codex called TrueMotion, used mostly in pre-rendered cutscenes in video games, for example in the Need for Speed series. Their codecs were focused on providing good enough fidelity at minimal file size, something very important for games that are limited by CD or DVD drive, but also something important for Google. They knew YouTube has potential, but people uh, in homes have slow connections, so they need small file sizes, and if they are going long term, it's better not to pay fees to MPEG. That's how VP8 was born, the codec that was built for the internet, but Google had a problem with software support. They did something clever. They open sourced this codec, and because of it, it found many more uses, for example, video calling, and also decided to make photo codec out of it. WebP. Yeah, WebP is a single frame of VP8 video. H.264 and VP8 were great for the HD era, but there were two shiny new things on the horizon 4K and VOD platforms like Netflix. Both H.264 and VP8 weren't designed for it, and that's how H.265 and VP9 were born. The new codecs built for 1080p and 4K. But corporations from MPEG Alliance were like, wait a minute, can we make even more money? Yeah, we can, let's increase the fees for H.265. But that wasn't enough for this greedy corporation. They decided to create an extra patent pool, so you need to pay a fee twice. So twice as much? Nah. And when Google, Netflix, Mozilla and couple of other corporations saw that, they said sayonara and formed alliance for open media. Google at the time was building a VP9 successor called VP10, and they decided to work on it together. Focus of this codec was scalability and best efficiency, both things at once, codec that would enable 720p streaming in regions with slow connections and at the same time could serve 8K for TVs. Because VP8 and VP9 codecs were Google only, the Alliance decided to change the name before releasing this codec. They renamed it to AV1, and that's the end of history lesson. Hey. I look different, I know, but now is the time to explain what is the codec exactly. 
You have this image. It weighs 5 megabytes. You compress it to 1 megabyte, it looks fine. You compress it to 100 kilobytes, and now it looks way worse. But because of that, we can clearly see how compression works. It works by grouping together a bunch of pixels to blocks of pixels, and then applies some formulas to these blocks. By limiting how big file can be, we have less and less of original data, and because of that we have visual artifacts. Newer image compression codecs can do a lot more advanced stuff to these blocks of pixels, and because of that it can recreate image more closely to original at the same file size. More advanced stuff means that it's way more demanding to decode and encode such image, but because processing power is increasing every year, heavier calculations become less problematic. Also, we can do a lot more optimizations now compared to 20 years ago. 20 years ago there wasn't any multicore CPU for desktops, and nowadays mobile phones have 8 cores. By using these 8 cores we can do a lot more calculations per second which improves speed and because we have same quality at lower size, it means that power efficiency will be higher. Modem in your smartphone can go to sleep faster because downloading took less time. Improved efficiency comes also from utilizing new instructions, such as AVX2 that AV1 decoders and encoders rely on. Video codecs can encode in two frame compression methods. First is interframe, and this is what is commonly used. In one frame there is full image, just like a JPEG file. This is called keyframe. Frames that come after that are modifications of keyframe. If something changed, moved, rotated or whatever, it will just push these existing pixels by doing mathematical calculations. These are called B and P frames. Eventually, after some frames, there is too much of new data in a scene, and these B and P frames cannot modify original keyframe enough to get good enough result. That's when new keyframe comes in and cycle repeats. This cycle of keyframe up to next keyframe is called GOP short for group of pixels. Bigger GOP will improve efficiency of encoding, but it will be more demanding for playback, as you cannot just play single frame, you need to reconstruct it by doing all of these calculations and then apply it on a keyframe that also needs some calculations. Second type of frame compression is intraframe. Intraframes are just keyframes, no B or P frames. Because of that, it's way less efficient in terms of file size to quality ratio, and in a low or medium bitrate scenario it will look like heavily compressed JPEG, whereas interframe will look good enough. Intraframe is never used outside of very niche use cases such as Apple ProRes codec. It's used there to minimize possible artifacts that could be visible if there would be a lot of motion on a solid scene, for example, flying hair on green screen. For a green screen you need maximum precision to key out background, and that's why intraframe is preferred. Back to codecs. H.264 does the least tricks to your video, and because of that all cameras, including mine, uses that as a codec. At high bit rates, there is minimal risk of affecting original image, including digital noise. The problem with less tricks is that it will completely fall apart when you need small file sizes. H.265 and VP9 are way better when you need small files, but because of licensing issues of H.265 and lack of adoption of VP9 outside of video platforms, video playback support is hit or miss. VP9 will work in Firefox, but many TVs that support H.265 won't play that because it wasn't adopted by any TV standard. AV1 is a very advanced codec and it's mind-blowing of 
what it's capable of. It manages to subtract digital noise from original scene, which means it will not only denoise noisy webcam, but also give you way more detail at a given bitrate, because it is not wasting these bits on unnecessary things. My favorite AV1 encoder, SVT AV1, is so clever at analyzing that it will even sharpen text when a whole image is just blurry mess. It knows so well what it should focus on to get maximum fidelity for human eye. But all of these tricks are just deal breakers when you need a big file that is as close to original as possible. There's a tons of complaints about that. This is a codec that enables high fidelity video at low bit rates and it shines in that category not in high bitrate scenarios. That's all I prepared for part one of this series. In part two, you will learn more in depth about codecs, bitrate and a lot more. Go watch part two now. Have a nice day.